it gives me great pleasure to invite Joe McCurr, Sid, oh, you know what, Julia, I'm going to kill Julia. I'll, I'll tell you later, Sid. <laughs> Sid Hill, she kept, Sid Hill and John Little. <laughs> Please come to the stage. <laughs> I told you. Okay. Brilliant. We're all, we all comfy. Shall I come yeah. sit next to you? Yeah, go on. Okay, great. All got drinks. Okay, so um, it has been a whirlwind of a day, a couple last couple of days, and we've got we've we've listened to so many different people, and obviously you know the work that you guys are doing is quite out there and quite amazing. And again, as I said, if you don't know who these three are, you need to have done your homework, but I'm sure you do. So we're not going to go into lots of um, of um, introductions as such, but what I would like to just hear first is a little bit about what. What was your point of entry, if you like, into becoming ecologically inclusive, is what I'm calling that? Um, you know, whether, whether it's through your gardening, what was it that switched you on to um, eco ecological inclusion? Shall I start with? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For me, I, I had a bit of an alternative upbringing in that I was home educated. And instead of going to school, I spent my time tending an edible forest garden and learning how to grow all of our own food ecologically making wine, juice, um, olives, and really growing up with, well, quite, quite privileged, but I, was, I had this opportunity to harvest my own food from an ecological system, and that, that really was a, the key, what drove me to the practice I'm at today. But going on from that, what really inspired me was actually, I was quite surprised over this two days, we haven't really talked about the further history of ecological gardening, because actually we've been doing this for thousands of years. There's horticultural cultures that have lived within their environment, cultivating edible and useful plants in ecological systems without degrading their environment. I mean, if we look to the Salish people in Vancouver in Canada, they cultivated edible forest gardens, which after 150 years without management, those systems are still highly biodiverse and producing food crops for people. Mm -hmm. And another really beautiful example, what has inspired me is, once again, the Salish people. And they actually cultivated wild flower meadows for one of their staple crops, which was the Kamasia bulb. And they, they were tending these wild but beautiful plantings for one of their staple crops. And I just think that that's completely incredible. And we talk about like, the start of ecological gardening in Beth Chatter and these people, but actually we should go back. We're talking about re or like unlearning. We're talking about all of these words at the moment. And I think we need to go further back because actually humans for most of our history have lived in the environment and there's still people living wild. And I think we need to look to that. So that's, that's really, for me, that's one of my inspirations. Yeah. No, that's really good to hear that. <laughs> Joe, what about yourself? Uh, yeah, I agree with Sid. I think we all have an innate gardener within us. Um, reaching that gardener is um, what we need to do. And that's an emotional journey more than anything else, actually. Um, and um, I remember when I first saw my land, my land's um, a post-industrial railway line <laughs> and uh, a, a former canal, um, canal site. Um, so it was, um, it had been ravaged, completely ravaged. Um, but there was this deep, deep, visceral, emotional connection to that landscape. Now, Mary Reynolds, um, great garden writer. She was formerly a garden designer and now is a reformed garden designer, she calls herself. Mm -hmm. She writes about how we um, see in landscape the trauma that's within ourselves, the emotional trauma that's within ourselves. And that's how we relate to landscape, that um, we've often deeply, deeply emotionally involved in landscape. And I, I really do believe that's right. And, you know, we've heard quite a lot um, over the past couple of days about feeling emotional about landscapes and this emotion or 
I actually have a problem with awe. Um, uh, I, um, I follow, I think, talk, I follow a lot of philosophy, and there's an ecological philosopher called Timothy Norton, and he says, putting um, nature on a pedestal and venerating it from afar is a bit like what patriarchy has done to the figure of a woman. So um, we need to stop objectifying nature and using language that does objectify it. Um, and it's that visceral emotional connection that can actually eviscerate all that language and get to a pre-language connection with our land. Mm -hmm. And that's where we all, I believe, need to be going. Mm -hmm. I mean, it... Yeah. I mean, the, the emotion thing, I can hear it in your yes. voice. Because, no, but that's what's really, that is the thing, isn't it? It's anything that you get, once your emotion is connected, yeah. you, are, you are invested. Yeah, um, well, our house and, is burning and, down. Yeah. You know, yeah. as Greta Thunberg says, and, you know, we feel passionate about yeah. this. Yeah. We need to feel passionate yeah, about passion, it. Yeah, the passion. And we need to actually not be Britishly polite about that anymore. We need to actually show it. And I, that's why I love the work of Gilles Clermont. You know, he puts a, a bit of land on top of a great <laughs> big plinth and actually the humans can't go there because he wants them to feel um, the shame of it, that we can't actually... We need to do that in order for nature to actually benefit from yeah. our absence. No, thank you, Joe. And, and yourself, um, uh, John, you know, in yeah, terms mine was of a bit simpler. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. I was, one, I was, a, I suppose, I was a weird kid, weird planty kid. That's a starter. And then, once you start looking at plants, and once you start gardening, like every one of us here is, you just, you just realise that gardening and plants and landscape is basically a fundamental to everything. I mean, absolutely everything. And this is why, when I, if I talk to students, landscape architects, that you know, you are in, you know, you, if you are in charge of the landscape, you are in control of. It. It's, Virtually everything, you know, health, I mean, flooding, urban heat island, food, everything is off the back of soil and plants, isn't it? You know what I mean? And so that, that's, I think, you start off as a gardener, you like, maybe you start off as a gardener, so it's a bit planty, and you stay on a bit planty, and then all of a sudden, all this other stuff starts to come in, in. then the wildlife comes in, and then, and all the other, and then when I uh, was lucky enough to work on public housing and social housing, then the people come in. So then you realize the joy of gardening when you see what people, how they react to it. So it's like the plant thing as a kid, as, you know, you realize it, you, you, you know, we're very privileged. And to look after public space in any way have an have a, uh, effect on public space, we are bloody lucky people to be able to do that. Mm. And it's a total joy. So I, I guess I, I started with plants like everyone, I guess, and then found, then you find all this other stuff. Mm. It's interesting because I, I, my, I sort of spoken before. My gardening, you know, as a child was to do the weeding. It was just not, you know, my mum was a big family, just didn't have time for that. But if I think back for when I was little, I did have a respect for the land because we were taught to respect picking up your rubbish and, you know, don't kill things and things. But not having like these connections as you guys are saying. And I think it's those entry points of when you feel the emotion, isn't it, really, as to w w when you come into your own awakening to, 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 to land. It's interesting, though, because actually, I'm, I talk about growing up with an edible forest garden, and I make it sound quite glamorous, but actually I had like two hours or an hour a day of weeding what I was meant to do for my, sure. my pocket money. <laughs> yeah. And actually at the time, I thought it was, yeah, a, a lot of work, but it was going actually harvesting food. Yeah. And actually, it wasn't until I started up a business at 15 when I realised that all of this time I'd spent in the garden could actually earn me money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, let's be real don't about that. Don't you think that, that the, the weed, I mean, the, 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 just the whole the thing about weeding, I don't know what you guys mm. think, but I really like, I love weeding. I mean, it just, uh, uh, just uh, but, uh, um, and we've lost, we've, we've certainly lost that kind of hands-on, that element to looking after public space has been budgeted out completely. You do not weed. Do you in public space? You know, certainly within social and poor areas, now you don't have the budget. You know, you spray, you cut grass, uh, and you trim stuff. You never have hand weeding. Hand weeding is virtually never written into a public space, and it's that it kind of connection with with, weed, with with weeding and with that. I don't know. There's something about that, and then it's, well, it's, it's reconnecting it's just people so to cool. stewardship and care, isn't it? Yeah, and and then it looks that role. That's how it looks so cared for, and people mm. love to see. 
people looking after space, don't you think? I think that it doesn't have to be a well-designed space. I think it just has to be cared for and looked after. That's what people seem to love. I, I find it really interesting, this thing of tending the landscape and the act of gardening, because really what we're doing is traditional ecological knowledge, what we've been doing for thousands of years. And I just find it really interesting, this act of tending the land, weeding, transplanting, um, pruning. We've been doing this for such a long time. And for, and for me, when we change the story of it, I think it can give more importance to it. Well, Joe, there was something that we were talking about, you know, just, just uh, you know, before, pre prior to this, which was, which is kind of think good to explore, which was this whole, um, the language mm. of gardening. So mm. use an example of when I was younger, weeding was a chore and it was ooh, not something that you really wanted to do, especially yeah. at age, age nine. Or a lot of time when people but, say, oh, I'm just a gardener. Yeah. It's just the, the, a gardener. The, yeah. And, uh, exactly. Such a shame, yeah. yeah. And, and you, were, you were sort of talking about, do you want to expand on that? Well, I mean, first of all, I hate um, do the dogma that is in a lot of gardening speak and the dichotomies that we set up, native, non-native, I mean, what does that even mean? <laughs> I don't really know um, because plants aren't even autonomous subjects, are they? They are actually part um, algae and part um, mycorrhizae and that, that then they form and then they form a whole mycorrhizal network underneath the soil so they're not even autonomous and how do you even know what the mycorrhizae partner that is most of the plant is native or non-native because we don't actually know the soil actually very well so I, 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 I don't know when we're putting in boundaries when there aren't actually any real boundaries um, mm -hmm. in, in, in and nature culture well actually you know that's the beauty of, of of being in the garden is that it's actually the it's the blurred line between the mm -hmm. two and it's that liminality and that kind of um that that space between that gives you the creative space to then be pioneering and kind of say like let's dispense with that language of the canons of uh, uh garden design past or the, the 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 vast canons of colonial landscape which are you know, absolutely dog us in when, we, when, we, when we look at landscape. Let's dispense of all of that and let's make a, a bubble, if you like, where we can imagine a new future, a novel ecosystem, but a novel ecosystem that is actually really, really regenerative and future-looking and really resourceful, resilient and hope-giving. Mm -hmm. We've got to cultivate hope. <laughs> haven't we, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, in our gardens? That's what we've got to cultivate. Hope in our minds. I mean, it's rewilding our minds, mm -hmm. as, 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 as the a, conference as the, as the subject says. Yeah. But I think, so going, going on sort of like from cultivation, if you like, takes me straight to sort of soil. There's been a couple of questions that have come in, and I'm just going to sort of amalgamate it, if you like, into, into sort of one thought for you guys to um, come back on. So, soil. Is it soil? Is it substrate? Is it concrete? Yeah, you know, we've had all these different growing mediums and different, you know, uses of things. And I think it would be good for you guys who are, you know, uh, experimenting, using, having different experiences of, I'm going to just loosely say soil. I'd like to hear from each of you your um, relationship with soil, either from projects that you've got or the work that you do, so that it can be really clear for the audience um, as to, to what soil means to you guys. And, and there is also a question, well, we'll start with that first. Sorry. Can I, Joe, I just want, I'd like to clear up, because I didn't think I'd made it clear enough when I was talking, I am in no way suggesting that we ripping out topsoil and chucking <laughs> in. Right. I am not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that that when there's a development or when you have a choice when the soil's taken off anyway, where you have that kind of, con you can have that conversation and it gives you the choice then of using a mixture of materials. And that mixture of materials, it's a very pragmatic view, is that mixture of material gives you a chance, and from my point of view, it gives you a chance, as Fergus touched, uh, touched on actually, to create a cheap dickster, basically. So, like, <laughs> poor soil, uh, direct sown, there's a chance you can look after it and, and you can get colour and you can get that level of uh, uh, sort of excitement into poorer places where the budget is so low. You know, you cannot uh, 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 do that easily in, a, in other ways. You know what I mean? So I think that's, for me, the, the, the joy of, of, of relatively low and inert substrates. But I am not suggesting that we rip out topsoil. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Because it's particularly for me, like, I, I, I mainly work with edible plants. That's my passion. And I'm trained as an ethnobotanist and a landscape designer. So what I do is create 
edible and ecological landscapes. And I find it really interesting whenever people talk about growing food, they're always trying to get this like black, humus rich, um, water attentive soil. But actually, most plants don't really like growing in that. Yes, your annual vegetables might do because they've been bred for a long period of time in this type of soil. And the key thing is they don't actually have a connection with many microorganisms in the soil. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I, I try to always work with the indigenous soil and then specify plants that are suited towards that habitat type. And I think something what we should start thinking about more is it's been talked about quite a lot over this last two days about succession in plant ecosystems. But what's actually going on underneath the ground? Succession in soil microbiology as well, like um, how earlier with the woodlands talking about the encroachment of brambles protecting, um, protecting young trees. But what it, the main thing they're actually doing as well is they're changing the soil microbiology to support trees. If you whack just some trees in a field and say grow, the problem is, is the soil microbiology is still at the successional stages of grass. So whereas if you transition that, and it, it gets very interesting, and at the moment there's so much interesting science coming out, and I think as our understanding develops further, it's going to become more about specifying plants for the specific soil microbiology, or also talking about that succession. Yeah. So if you're, if you're growing trees, maybe what, something what I've experimented with is actually planting into brambles. Yeah. So they, they pr protect it, and then it's also transitioning that soil microbiology to a fungally dominated biology, mm -hmm. rather than the bacteria dom dominated in a lot of grasslands. Yeah, again, reading the landscape, aren't you? Mm. Um, reading the empirical yeah. evidence on the landscape, which is a, a craft that we need to return to. I mean, the soil is the guts of the planet and um, we all know that our, our own gut biome, our own human gut biome, it, we've sort of rediscovered it as a whole ecosystem in itself and, mm. and, and uh, you know the majority of, um, in this region of the world, the majority of life actually when you look out on a landscape is held in the soil. I mean we only know 10% of that life mm. but it, it, there is absolutely hundreds upon thousands of species living in that soil that you're looking at and they are all doing all sorts of different things and there is huge amounts of complexity there and so you know what, what we need to do is be respectful of that which I feel we're not massively respectful but the other thing that we need to understand is that um, this this biological concept that with um, the, the complexity is held in the soil and with complex complexity over time and space comes diversity so <laughs> you, you've got to invest in your in, cultivate your soil in order for your soil to better farm your plants mm -hmm. um, you know it's the it's all it's all in there we, we we don't really have the tools we have very blunt tools in in Fertilizers and which, which I guess is a, you know, for me that that in, in that is, is is people is it they don't care or is it a lack of understanding because as you say it is a complex ecosystem of which only as you know, ten percent is there and and of course going back to uh, dialogues that are talked about with the soil yeah. we are encouraged to enrich soils you know there's a there's a well, language that, around there's that. a language there which, is again isn't it we, we don't talk about healthy soils we talk about fertile soils mm. i mean uh, you know fertility has absolutely nothing to do with healthiness mm. you know uh, john and i work with low nutrient soils and the reason we work with that is because we want healthy plants now we you know we will know the vim hof method and everything like that you know you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to stress stress um, a plant's ability, well actually it's the mycorrhizae's ability to cope and adapt. Constant little stresses, constant little stresses make, grows resilience mm -hmm. and resistance to when the big drought comes, to when the big thing happens. Yes, yeah, yeah. so because, you know, um, uh, uh, um, it's estimated that a mycorrhizae can actually um, add about 100 times more to the root of a plant. <laughs> It's a whole network that of added opportunity. Mm. I think that's one of the really interesting things about this idea of planting bare root. 
because so much of the soil we put into ground with around plants has all of this synthetic fertilizer and other additives. So that plant sits in that pot for a long time, having that sort of candy, and it doesn't create these connections with mycorrhizal fungi and, and other microorganisms in the soil. So and then when you do have a drought, what do you think happens? It just is still staying in that little pot of soil and, it's, and it dries out and dies. Mm. So I, I yeah. think there's a lot. So that, that's, that's you know, that's the thing, isn't it? It's not, it's not in the... The labelling of the plant as drought tolerant, or et cetera, et cetera, is not as relevant as basically understanding that the majority of the adaptation mm -hmm. resides within the health of the, of the soil. I mean, I, I think mean, it's... Oh, I, I, I was just going to say, I think we, the, the, there's, a huge, there's a huge area of research into mycorrhizae and what goes on mm. with stuff. Because we, we found when we, for instance, put um, an inert substrate on top of... Say we put 300 mil on top of uh, some topsoil, um, it's even though the sand, when we test the sand, it's really low in, in MPK and it's, it's, it's seemingly a hostile place. Mm. There must be, and I'm not sure, I know Peter's, I think, has got some research going on in this. There must be a, somehow the nutrients or something has happened to take the, the, the nutrients from the base soil up into the new substrate. I don't know whether it's mm. pioneer mycorrhizal uh, fungus, maybe, if there's such a thing. I'm guessing there probably is, but something happens because plants just grow away like crazy mm. yeah. when their roots, I know, have not hit the soil. I mean, you're but using... There's something sea, about that. There's something about... There's, there's something moving there very yeah. quickly into the new substrate, which is, is, is really interesting. So many interesting, on, on interesting things on this topic. I, I, I spend quite a lot of my time travelling around. We're on my bike, exploring different natural landscapes or wild landscapes. It's the idea of nature. Um, but I came across this meadow in Italy where there was Vicia faba growing alongside all of these wild flowers in a really beautiful meadow. And they all looked really healthy. And I, it got me thinking and researching as well about Vicia faba because the idea of using it in these edible ecosystems. And if anyone's grown Vicia faba, the broad bean, they've, they've probably found that it gets these aphids on it. And actually, what I, what I found was actually, so in, in, a, in a soil where there's mycorrhizal fungi, the Vicia faba actually, when one plant gets, um, gets this aphid, it then communicates through the mycorrhizal fungi with other plants. So they can start making an alkaloid in their leaf to fight it off. But the problem is, is if we have a garden, what we're constantly disturbing the soil and breaking up all of these mycorrhizal fungi, what happens? Mm. They're like babies and we have to feed them. We have to do all of this stuff, adding in additives and all of... Mm. I, in, in my work, I look to find more wild type plants that are, are tough and still have these associations with all of the mycorrhizal and other, other microorganisms. Mm. Yeah, I think what's interesting about all three of us is we often all use seed. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's relatively cheap and all these other things, but... Um, I think a seed with a, a, additional potted plants. Yeah, uh, I mean, but, you know, uh, there was some new research out recently which uh, showed that uh, a very new plant just germinating will pump roughly 20 to 40 percent more sugars into mm. the substrate it's growing into in order to attract mycorrhizal life to it mm. so we've got when you're using these young plants they are more promiscuous than um let's think of it in terms of kind of like you know hey guys let's have a party um they're more <laughs> promiscuous they're looking for more relationships and i wonder whether that's a similar thing when we've got the what we perceive to be low nutrient soil they're actually quite high in carbon which would obviously yeah. um, benefit a microbial and a mycorrhizal population. Yeah, and maybe we've got a more promiscuous population in that type of soil that, again, kind of like wants to partner up. And that's, that's why you get that sort of instant explosion in diversity. Yeah, yeah. And it's the base, but that base soil is crucial because the work we did on the car park, for instance, that I showed, that was on top of granite type one, which has obviously been completely disturbed. And there was, there was very little, obviously, mycorrhizal base when we put the sand on top of that. So the plants really, there was an incredibly marked difference between the growth and, and the seeming health of those plants than they were when we put the sand on anything like normal soil or any, you know, it was incredible, the difference. Yeah, I was uh, just wondering... Much, much, you know, un, much more unhappy. Certainly the first year. It'd be interesting to see what happens in subsequent years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether there, you know, there will be mycorrhizal that come and kind of help them out. But this first couple of years, they're not looking particularly happy. And so what... So there's something that's come through and here about, yeah. like, compaction. 
and, you know, and do you worry about compaction? And of course, we've got lots of, uh, of confliction. I'm listening now in terms of be a pig, <laughs> root all the soil, disturb it, don't disturb it because we've got mycorrhizae, do no dig. You know, if you think of it as a, as a as the member of the public, which is what the view I'm always taking, I'm always interested to think these lots of these different conversations that go on. And so I'm just interested from you, your point of views, you know, what, what do you do in terms of when you think of compacted soils or moving soils? I try not to move it, mm -hmm. if I possibly can. Um, obviously, I had to move some stuff, but I, I, would, I would try not to move it, um, if I possibly could. And um, uh, I try and use plants um, and the organisms within the soil. I mean, basically, we've got to understand the more different root structure we have in the soil, the more we're going to remediate that soil. You know, phytoremediation is really, really, really coming on quick and fast now. Phytoremediation is, is removing pollutants from, from the soil. But it also, you know, really encourages then that worm action, the, the various different aerations and things like that that, that happen when, uh, that can relieve compaction. I mean, I really don't believe in... Um, machinery relieving of compaction <laughs> anymore. I don't believe it really long-term works. Okay. I think it's just got to, you've just got to really work with it. I mean, I had a severely compacted um, area of uh, canal that was um, stagnant, uh, a, a base of canal, and I uh, seasonally applied every year uh, Ramiel wood chip, which is one-year-old wood chip, every single year, and the white rot went, immediately went crazy um, in this area. And then over a couple of years, I then put in um, hazels, because I'd heard that hazels make the most promiscuous relationships with different types of mycorrhizae. I fully expected them to not do very well at all, and they absolutely shot up. Um, and the whole place, I mean, this is the thing, you know, we come back again. I don't have an entomologist who can come and tell me I'm doing the right thing or an ecologist who can come. That. But empirically, I think it's okay because it used to smell of bad eggs and it used to stink and it used to give me that bad chilly feeling, you know, when you go into a place and it doesn't feel right. And now I go into it and it smells like a woodland floor mm -hmm. and um, it, it crumbles beneath my feet and it's soft. Yeah. So... We need a smellscape. Yeah. And soundscapes. We need smellscape. Oh, well, you, we need every, every sense, don't we? Every, yeah, yeah. We need to trust all our senses now because, like, innate within us, I'm sure, are all, all, the, all the abilities to read landscape. We must have been brilliant at reading landscape at one point in time. That's probably why we're such a super species. But we've lost, then, that ability because we've tried to kind of, like, rid ourselves of the emotional responsibility that comes with it. Mm. Okay, thank you. We're going to sort of come away from... Well, well, actually, one last thing on soils, actually, that was um, also um, a question that came in. And so, and I say soil stroke substrates. Um, some of the substrates that have been talked about, um, John, especially sort of like, you know, bringing in, um, say, like a... Um, crushed toilets um, and things. <laughs> uh, there, there was a question about, does that in itself, you know, what's the risk of contaminant coming in from, from those substra substrates? Well, I guess you just got to rely on your supplier for that, really, because they're not going to be sending this stuff out to construction industry either. With uh, that's not going to be uh, allowed, so you can only rely on that. It's never going to be, you know. I mean, I, I guess if you start poking around and testing, it's never going to be quite as sweet as your, as, your, as your lovely bit of topsoil. But you've got to rely on the fact that they, that it's a sold product and it's from a reliable uh, supplier. I guess that's that's all you can do. Yeah. So I, th I think as well, it, it's. What I think what we'll find coming out more and more now is actually if you are doing work like yourself and you're planting these really diverse plant communities into that, what better remediation is there really? Well, this is what I always think. I mean, we're not growing, you know, we're not growing our favourite veg in this. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a thing to produce, produce flora. And, uh, yeah, what a nice... I mean, to go from that, I love that, that slide of that kind of crushed kind of fairly depressing looking material and then and then what it does i mean plants are just remarkable don't you think i mean they are you c i don't know as soon as you you sort of you, you get that in your head and you realize that they will just deliver on virtually any material mm -hmm. it's quite a, a freeing uh, thing as a gardener um, yeah. so I so we have most of the trouble we have is is plants growing too well <laughs> in in the respect that we what we want to keep the stress level up mm -hmm. to keep the diversity and to keep 
open I don't want to keep the maintenance down, but the practicalities are you have to keep the maintenance down to, to deliver that stuff, you know. So when we put a bit of sand, and if we put it on top of topsoil, those plants grow like they're in topsoil virtually after two years, or after the first year even. It's yeah. weird. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure, and I know Peter's looking at it, and, and, and I'd like, really like to understand how that nutrient level and, and, and whatever else is happening is boosting those mm. plants that much. It's quite remarkable. If you put them on subsoil, slightly less, and if you put them on granite type one, like I did in the car park, a lot less. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, it's very much dependent on what's underneath. You know? I, I inherited a site that's obviously, I can't dig it at all because it's heavily polluted with heavy metals underneath the whole lot. So, um, you know, that, that gives you um, immediately a kind of like, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it ties, it both ties your hand, the hands back, behind your back, but also necessity is the mother of all inventions. So you have to think about how you're going to remediate soil with, with the plants. And interestingly, you know, uh, um, I, I grow various different meadows, but interestingly, the plants that came into the meadows were actually then um, uh, identified, I identified lots of tall melliots and things like that, which are, are renowned for sort of going deep and, 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 re and removing heavy metal toxins and various different things like that. But, um, I mean, it, you know, pollution is everywhere. You know, it's in our rain, it's in our, it's in our water courses, it's in our air. Um, it's going to be in our soils. Yeah. Just got to look after them. Yeah. Keep them healthy. Okay, I'm going to kind of um, move on um, to the sort of next topic, as it were, which was how has climate change um, affected your if not your choice of plants, but the techniques um, that, you, um, that you continue with to protect biodiversity with, what, how has climate change maybe affected some of the things that you have done? How have you shifted and changed? We want to hear about those. I, I think for me, like climate change has always been talked about in my family since I was really young. Um, and actually, it was when I started hearing about like techniques and, and um, different projects in permaculture where they're like regreening deserts and turning it into food forests, capturing rainwater. This is what really inspired me. And then when I went to university, uh, I studied landscape design in my second two years. I came across the work of like Nigel Dunnett, James Hitchmo, and, and some of the people who are talking here, um, where they're, they were designing these beautiful um, herbaceous meadows, which were really biodiverse and quite a low maintenance system for public landscapes. But coming from a permaculture and like an ethnobotanical background, I was like, surely there's a, there's a missed trick here. We could, we could be designing these low maintenance biodiverse plantings, but we could actually be doing it with the thousands of edible plants available to us today from around the world. So over the last five years, I've been really researching the, this, this concept of edible wildflower meadows. And there's, there's very little on it, apart from what I said earlier about this, um, this, the Salish people. And so it's, it's been going really well, this research. I've, I've created quite a few edible meadows, meadows that look really beautiful. And then I've harvested a salad of like 19 different species, which is, is good. But there, there's people in the, like the permaculture circle, like um, Stephen Barstow, who's created a salad with over 500 different plants. And a lot of people see it as like, is this going to be like some sort of weedy thing or something? But actually, there are thousands of edible plants available to us. Mm. So I think that there's so much potential to tap into the current research on ecological planting design, but and then take that forward using plants that support human existence. Because it's very nice to carry on talking about creating these landscapes like rewilding and creating biodiverse landscapes, but what are we going to eat? Mm. With climate, climate change is here. We, it's, we're not living in a very secure, uh, like food secure world. Mm -hmm. like, it may seem like it, but it's very brittle. And being in Cornwall, it's, it's a bit more with imports. It's a little bit more scary. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been experimenting with this idea of edible wildflower meadows. And I think that's, that's really what's really exciting me. I mean, that would, right. yeah, because we, we found uh, on, on the estate, the food thing was the total key to engaging people. 
Mm. Totally the key. If, if you know, and, and to, uh, we, what we, we did, we didn't get, it'd be really interesting to, to know whether that could, the meadows could work as mm. well. I mean, we just, we just planted food stuff everywhere. You know, we did, it was just a completely random, we made food plants the default public planting. So if a pyracantha died, we'd put a gooseberry bush in. Or if a, you know, it's just a no, no planning, no, no design, no, no, nothing at all. Just get edible plants into the landscape. And then we found that people really noticed the land. They did, they, they, yeah. you know, evergreen shrubs and whatever it is, ornamental stuff that we put in. The community on our estate definitely, they, they noticed the landscape because there was food in it. And then once there's food in it, obviously they can harvest the food that's in it. So I think that the, the whole, the, the food thing is key to engage in, in, uh, in public space, especially in those areas close up to where people live, you know. And if we could integrate edible meadows into that, which I never did, and, and it was, you know, I didn't, I didn't even think of that. I mean, that would be beautiful as well, wouldn't it? But just get stuff in, because that, that's what people get energised by, I, we found anyway. And I think it, with, the thing is, with something what Poppy mentioned earlier about this, like, when you grow food, it's a direct connection between a human and the so, like, natural world, or uh, more than a human world. And I, I, I know, I've, I've watched in some of the projects I do, like my client's, um, the client's granddaughter walking through this, this woodland edible forest garden and harvesting a strawberry. Or say, if you think back to your childhood, and maybe you might have harvested some apples off of a tree. And that makes you, that adds to your story. And that makes you care more about the wildlife that we depend on for our lifeline. And I think that's, we really need to be starting to talk about food as a landscape industry because actually we, are, we have a lot of control over our landscapes and we need to rewild our food system, our diet, uh, the, our whole way of life. And that's what I think is the perfect thing about this symposium, about rewilding the mind because it's, everything's inter interconnected. Yeah, I think it's that, that whole thing about the space we've got is just so precious that mm. we've really got to absolutely concentrate on getting whether it's biodiversity or food or whatever it is just getting the maximum out of the space that we've got mm -hmm. um, but without with, but but don't lose the connection to the people that are living there because mm -hmm. you have to be a bit careful of that and I was guilty of doing that when I first went onto the estate I, I planted you know pears and apples because my my uh, granddad planted pears and apples, mm. and, and I thought I was really doing uh, them a big favour. And uh, it turns out they didn't want pears and apples, they wanted medlars and they wanted grapevines and they wanted figs, obviously, because that's what, you know. So I was imposing my kind of very, you know, South Essex vegetable <laughs> fruit growing <laughs> opinion onto people that were living there. And it's, that was a massive mistake. And I think biodiversity, you have to be really careful to not say, here you go, here's some biodiversity, it looks a bit shit, mm. but it's good for biodiversity. So, you, you know, we, we, it, there's an arrogance to that if we're not really careful. Mm. And, and I think certainly intimate spaces around housing, we, we definitely can't do that. We've got to respond to what people think. I think that that's really one of the things why I created this idea of edible wildflower meadows, because for years I was, t I was talking about sustainability and I was sharing pictures of a pear tree or something and, and talking about all of these functional aspects. And... I was, then I shared a picture of a wildflower meadow and like it just blew up and it's because beauty captures people's imagination and the opportunity I think which is there is once you have someone's um, um, attention and their imagination you can then inspire them about eco-literacy or a love for nature or, or to teach them about how this meadow is, is producing food but it's supporting biodiversity, it's filtering pollutants through the air, it's, and I, I think that's, that's the key as landscape designers, this, this like merging of art and science. We're really in a key role where we can capture people's imagination with beauty and then teach them to change society. OK, thank you. Well, I'm going to not respond to that because I've got one last question I want to get to because of the time. Um, and, and really, I'm going to go to you first, Joe. Um, what do you think needs to happen in the future, as soon as we're going from there, to activate and rewild the minds and therefore landscapes of future generations? And I mean in the context of the work that, that you're doing. Big, Big question. question. Um, well, it would be really useful for us to dispense of this idea that um, we know everything and we are omniscient in any in some sort of way it would be really useful to have um, the beginnings of 
um, much more research and much more knowledge-based sharing about soil biology and how soil biology can help us grow resilience and um, regenerative um, functions in, in our garden. That would be really, really useful. But um, more than anything else, I think we have to have this attitude now that um, we don't really try and necessarily um, try and just grow the plant or the plant community. We try and work to steward the soils so they can better farm the plants. Mm -hmm. Because um, th th these fungi um, and, and microbes, they've been, they've been stewarding and, mm -hmm. and, and farming plants mm -hmm. for 460 million years. Uh, they kind of know what they're doing. They've managed to um, get plants out of the ocean and onto desolate wasteland. Um, they've done it once before. They've, they've, they've found ways round really extreme situations of excessive rain, excessive sun. But um, what I would counsel everybody to do is understand that your soil biology is very, very sensitive to heat, so cover it. Cover it, keep it at 20 degrees Celsius if you can, and, um, and look after it um, if you want it to look after your plant. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Sid? Um, yeah, I, I think what I would like to see is, so when I got into horticulture, when I started studying at college, and I, when I used to tell people, oh, I'm studying horticulture, they would be like, Oh, nice, that's nice. You should arrange pretty, fr pretty flowers, do you? And actually, I think there's, there's quite a problem in the, like the, the recent history and like the whole time scale of horticulture being aimed, or, or, or the story of it being communicated as um, like a privilege or just about arranging pretty things, about ornate aspects. But actually, I think that the story of horticulture needs to change and we need to be talking about, like in this conference, we need to be telling the story of horticulture as a necessity. Horticulture for really helping us move towards a sustainable future by capturing carbon, by producing food, by um, increasing biodiversity. And I think this needs to be taken into our academic settings. We need to be talking about this in colleges. I mean, I, I graduated not that long ago, really, and I feel like it was only very, like, scratch the surface of ecological systems and like, concepts like rewilding. So I, I think what I would like to see is for us all to be talking about horticulture and, and gardeners as the change makers. Yeah. for a sustainable future. And maybe, you know, because you, you've touched on rewilding, because we're talking about rewilding the mines, it's like rewilding is kind of like not a goal-based um, uh, 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 way of thinking. It's, um, it's, it's about reintroducing nature's mm -hmm. natural processes and then letting those natural processes drive, drive the system and drive the process. It's about the process, it's not about heading anywhere in particular. So um, I think it's about an age of experimentation and pioneering mm. work and Thanks. letting go of success and failure as, <laughs> as something to, 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 to benchmark yourself against and, mm. and actually just um, really, really being playful and inventive in the environment. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up to John. Yeah. His last well, I was just going to say, I, I think the John bigger Shaw. picture and all that, those, that, that thing, that needs to happen. But I, I'd like to, I mean, some of the figures that yesterday were talked about for the, the amount of money that's invested in, say, one single site, I can't remember what figures, but 16 million comes to mind. Give me 16 million you, and, and, and to, 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 to invest in gardeners on social housing estates in London, and you could totally transform the whole of that space for many, many, many years. You know? and, um, and, and of course, while, while, while you're doing that, while there's that care and attention, there's that interaction, and then there's all the education that comes from better environments that people can live in. Mm -hmm. So I think that somehow, I know I've already said this before, but I just think somehow we've got to move the mindset from infrastructure funding to funding for caring for places. You know? Well, I want to thank the three of you so much. I'm, ver I'm very proud that these three have all been on Gardener's World. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. So, you know, the communication thing, as you know, I'm passionate about. There's two million people that watch these people, OK? No, that's great. But really, you know, we, we I think on, on probably behalf of the audience, you know, we know that you are pushing boundaries 
um, and being pioneering. And actually, the, the, these three uh, people are, are really open to sharing what they've got, not just here on the couch, but in real life situation, courses, visits, you know. So look them up and, you know, because it is a new way of thinking. And I've certainly learned a huge amount um, from the three of you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.